Hello, fictional. Welcome to the What If Issei. Today we are gonna see, What If Issei is Son of Serzich's and Grafia. Part 1. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Issei, I'm done with my shift, I've gotta get home so I'll leave you to lock up okay. A girl's voice called out to Issei. He was working the evening shift at his local convenience store, a job he had taken up for two reasons. One, after his parents' death in a horrific train wreck at the start of the summer, he had to find some way to pay the bills, and while his parents had already paid off the house and insurance payouts would keep him going until he graduated, without work, he would have no money to do the things he enjoyed. The second reason had just left, the daughter of the owner of the convenience store who was also a part-timer Carolyn. A short buxom foreigner with long, wavy ginger hair, had caught his eye one day when he was in the store shopping, and when she noticed that his gaze was on her for a little too long, she asked him what was wrong. He responded with the first thing that popped into his head, do you have any openings for part-timers? She simply smiled at him and handed him an application form, one week later he was the one behind the counter and has been there for most of his last summer vacation before high school. Before his parents died they had encouraged him to try and get into Kuo Academy, a prestigious institution that until this coming year had been a girl's only school. He had been studying hard and the entrance exam was held last month. He was due to get his results any day now, he and his two friends, Mitsuda and Motohama, had agreed to try and get in together. The three, known to most as the perverted trio, had agreed to try and get in in order to form harems from the girls at the school, however after the train wreck, Issei had another reason on his mind to get in, making his parents proud. Ever since they had passed away Issei had spent more and more of his time studying and less time hanging out with his friends. They still came to see him every so often, they once came into the store while he was working, and when his friends asked him why he was working there, he just pointed over to the checkout where Carolyn was standing. They'd gotten the idea quickly. Ring. Issei was brought out of his thoughts when someone entered the store. At this hour really. Issei thought looking at the darkness outside the storefront windows. The girl who entered was small with white hair that had cat pins threaded through it. If he had to guess Issei would say that she looked to be a year younger than he was. He thought she looked pretty cute, but wondered why she was out at this late hour. Welcome. Issei said with a rehearsed smile, the girl didn't acknowledge him and simply went to the sweets aisle, emerging with more sweets than she could realistically carry. She brought them over to Issei and placed them on the counter, along with a 2,000 yen bill. Issei rung up the purchase and asked if she needed a bag. The girl nodded and walked out with sack of sweets. When the girl left Issei began closing up the shop. He turned the sign around, locked the front door, and took the trash out to the back alley, locking the back door behind him. There was another thing about him that few people knew, ever since he was young he could use magic, even he wasn't sure how. When he told his parents about it they were just as confused as he was, that was the day when they told him that he was actually adopted. It was a shock to him at the time, but since then Issei had come to terms with the fact, although he did find himself wondering on slow days who his birth parents were and whether they knew about his other secret. Shaking his head to clear his mind Issei took the bags of trash and set them in the bins, pressing them down, so any passerby would be unable to see what he did next. Focusing his magic into his hand he created a small ball of black and red magic in his palm, he called it runation, or destruction, since this particular magic destroyed anything it touched. He quickly used it to destroy the bags of trash, saving space in the bins. He always did his best to make sure that no one ever saw him use his magic, but today, it seemed that he was negligent as a man with long silver hair ran into the alley, looking fearfully over his shoulder. Issei overheard the man speaking to himself, damn it Hines, just had to come to her territory, didn't you, Crimson Ruin Princess really is an appropriate name, that bitch is terrifying. That's when the man noticed Issei. Lucky me, it seems I won't go hungry tonight at least. Sorry boy, but this is the end for you. The man walked up to Issei and began licking his lips. Issei backed up a bit and held his arms up to block whatever attack was coming. Stop right there. The voice of a young woman came from the entrance of the alleyway. In the name of House Gremory, I have been sent here to end you Heinz Kallenheim, oh, we have a civilian, Kaneko, grab him. On it. A figure launched herself towards the madman, but the alley's shadows seemed to move to cover her face, keeping Issei from getting a look at anyone other than Heinz. The figure knocked him to the ground with a clothesline. But then screamed out in pain when he bit her arm as she hit him. In the second that it bought him the man managed to throw the girl back towards her master. Issei at this point had turned to run away. Not so fast little snack. The man yelled giving chase. Issei turned around for a moment and used his magic to create a wall of ice between him and the madman. Using the time it bought him Issei ran home as fast as possible, already ruling out getting the authorities due to his magic use and the sheer weirdness of the event. It's not like they would have believed his story anyway. 
When all was said and done there wasn't even a shred of the stray devil's clothing left. Kaneko the girl who'd bought sweets from Issei earlier held her arm where Heinz had bitten her. Despite the rook's defensive prowess the creature's jaw had the strength of a vice and it certainly left some damage. Meanwhile her king was inspecting the wall of ice. This was magic. Did he even use a casting circle? Rhea's gremory wondered aloud. Like the other members of her peerage they'd been able to get a clear look at the boy, although they'd used magic to conceal their appearance. She was wondering who the boy was and if he was a threat, if so she may need to take action. Her knight broke her train of thought, jumping down from the roof where she'd stationed him to cut off the stray devil's escape. However he'd been beaten to the punch by the one who created the ice wall they'd used to corner the stray against. Rhea's, if I may, he used a magic circle, and at that speed the spell had to be second nature from practice or instinctive for him. But that's not the most interesting part. The blonde-haired boy said with a troubled look on his face. The magic circle was identical to that of the Lucifuge family. How is that possible? Rhea's wondered eyes widening in surprise. The last of their line is Grafia, there isn't even a second or third cousin left after the war. She thought to herself before giving her orders out to her servants Akeno take and preserve a piece of this ice, we'll get it examined later. Hineko, Kiba, I want you two to look into who this boy is, we need a name, date of birth, family, anything you two can find. His name is Issei. Kaneko said matter-of-factly. How do you know that? Rias asked surprised. That's what his name badge said. I bought sweets from him earlier. Kaneko said plainly. Well that's a start. Rias said a slight smile coming to her face at their fortune before dismissing her peerage for the night. Issei had more or less decided to ignore his strange encounter in the midsummer as fall rolled around. While he was worried about what had occurred he had been unable to see anyone other than the silver-haired man during the actual event, attack, he wasn't sure what to call it. When he'd returned to work the next day he had found no trace of the man or his attackers and had sensed something strange in the alley's atmosphere that he was unable to name. The best way he could describe it was that it had given him the same feeling in his body as when he used his magic. All that he learned from the attack were two names, Kaneko and the Crimson Ruin Princess, but without knowing who those people are Issei was left grasping at straws. Out of options he had decided to push the incident from his mind and focus on the end of his junior high career. He was one of the few lucky males that had managed to get through all three stages of enrollment for Kuo Academy, and now he returned to school, but remained distant with his friends, neither of them had passed the interview section of the enrollment process and were focusing on getting into a nearby high school if possible. This meant Issei should have been alone at lunch and after school, as he was unable to hang out with the pair. Well he was supposed to be alone, but as soon as school had started up again there was a new transfer student, a boy by the name of Yudo Kiba, who through looks had half the girls in the school at his feet almost immediately and had gained the other half with his matching personality. He was put into Issei's class and Issei had been expecting to load the boy as soon as he met him, but the pair ended up getting along swimmingly. Both of them were going to Kuo Academy next year. The two were sitting on the rooftop of the school eating lunch, while a few girls hung out by the roof's entrance, stalking Kiba who was acting like he didn't notice. So are you planning on joining a club in high school? It's a bit late for junior high, but you can't exactly be a full-time pervert again next year. You could end up getting expelled. Kiba warned as he prepared to take a bite of food. Very funny pretty boy, I'm not sure. How about you, Kendo again? Issei asked through the mouthful of rice he was in the middle of eating, although his friend was able to understand. Well Kendo would be nice, I'm interested in the occult research club, apparently the one at Kuo is the best funded in the country. Kiba said taking the time to swallow before he spoke, something his companion failed to do. The cult research? Didn't have you pinned for a believer in the supernatural. Issei said raising an eyebrow, the irony of the statement not lost on him. Didn't have you pinned for a skeptic. Kiba said looking a little shocked. Well, it's not that I don't believe it, I just never expected you to be into magic, ghosts and all that. Issei said hiding his nervousness under a relaxed grin. Unknowns to Issei, Rhea's Gremory had her familiar watching the two from a tree branch nearby. I'm gonna get going, I need to make a stop before heading back to class. Kiba said getting ready to go. Seeing him stretching the girls around the roof began to prepare to leave as well. I'll take care of the trash, just leave it with me. Issei said with a smile. Thanks man. Kiba said taking off towards the stairwell in a sprint, the girls jazzing after him, although Issei could tell he was holding back. He cursed the pretty boy under his breath. He'd seen the man run before and knew that he could outpace the girls if he tried even a little, he was deliberately holding back, although for whose sake Issei wasn't sure. When Issei was sure that both Kiba and his followers were gone, Issei picked up a wrapper from the small pile of trash next to him and threw it up in the air. Taking his hand he made a finger gun and pointed it at the trash. Then casting a spell a small ball of destruction magic went flying at the trash, disintegrating it instantly. 
Issei had a little laugh at it and then took three more pieces and did the same thing hitting the three all at once with one ball. Issei then finished his own food, continuing the little game of his until he had destroyed all of the trash. At that point the bell rang and lunch break ended. Meanwhile the lunch bell had also rung Akuo Academy, but first year president of the occult research club, Ria's Gremory was too shocked to move. She had just witnessed the boy she and her peerage had been investigating for the past few months, not only use her family's hereditary magic, but what's more, he was showing precision and skill with it, despite receiving no training of any kind. She didn't have to question her next move for long calling up her fellow first-year Sona to excuse her from afternoon classes, she headed to the underworld to talk to her family, her queen, Akeno Himejima coming with her. Maybe her family could shed some light on this mysterious Issei Haidu. Mother, father, I need to talk with one of you. Ria said as she entered her family home, servants bowing at her entrance. I'm sorry Lady Ria's, both the Lord and Lady are out at the moment. I'm guessing since you are missing class it is important. Grafia said bowing to the young heiress. Indeed it is, perhaps you could help me instead. Ria said recalling what her knight had said about the ice. She had forgotten to get it checked out being more interested in finding out who just who the boy was. Very well, what seems to be the problem? Grafia responded curious at what had brought her sister-in-law to see her. Could we speak in a private room? Ria's asked. I don't want anyone overhearing us. Very well, this way. Grafia said leading Ria's and Akeno towards another room. When they arrived Grafia locked the door as Ria sat down, Akeno moved to stand behind her king. Heading over Grafia sat across from the pair. What problem could be so important that it couldn't wait until after school? You were the one who demanded to go to school in Japan after all Ria's. Grafia said, letting her servant persona slip a little. Well you see, it's about a boy that I encountered during the summer break. Ria started. You won't get out of your engagement that easily. Grafia said with a smirk. She hated Riser as much as the next woman, but she also knew that the Grimmery family needed the Phoenix family and vice versa. There were no other possible pairings since her and Serzich's were unwilling to give Milika's future away at such a young age, leaving the two stuck trying to help Ria's as much as they could without outright cancelling the marriage and starting a feud between families. It's nothing like that Ria's protested. When I first saw him I thought he was just a normal human, but he was being attacked by a stray at the time. I was going to kill the stray, then remove his memories of the incident, but then something happened. Akeno if you please. At that her queen placed a piece of ice on the table in front of Grafia. He began to run in fear and created a wall of ice, using magic. I didn't even see him use a magic circle he did it so fast, and the wall was big enough to fill the entire alleyway. Kiba was the only one with a proper view and fast enough eyes to catch the magic circle. It was, Ria's breathed in taking a moment to collect her thoughts and prepare for the tirade of questions that surely followed. It was the same as yours. Ria's finished. Rafia looked shocked, she held her hand over the ice to feel it. She knew the feeling of her own family's magic, and the feel of it shocked her. Why didn't you contact anyone about this earlier? She asked her eyes glistening at the possibility although she kept it hidden from Ria's and Akeno. She knew not to let herself hope, she couldn't let anyone else know until she was certain. She didn't want anyone else to be disappointed in the entirely likely possibility that she was wrong, but she still let hope live inside her for even a brief moment. It had been a long time since she'd last felt it. I wanted to do more research, see if he was from another faction, or even a magician skilled in illusions attempting to confuse us for some reason. Riaz explained. I had Kaneko follow him when he was working and out of school. I also transferred Kiba into his class to befriend him. The boy is an orphan, and not just that his parents were adoptive. I haven't gotten close enough to check and see if he is a devil for myself, but, Ria's took a breath collecting herself again. Today I had my familiar watch him during the lunch break and I saw something amazing. This boy possesses the power of destruction, the hereditary magic of the Ball family, I would recognize it anywhere. Ria's finished her report and was about to ask her questions, but was interrupted by Grafia before she could begin. Lucius. Grafia said a few tears sliding down her face. The last detail had solidified her vague hope into a likely possibility. Pardon? Ria's asked calmly but a little nervous, she had never seen Grafia cry, not even once. It was, unsettling. That was the name of Milika's older brother. He was taken from us, 13 years ago. I had already put him to bed and Serzich's and I were in a meeting. A rogue fallen angel broke into our home and kidnapped him. Their brother and me were distraught, half the underworld was scrambled hunting for him, even the higher-ups in the Grigori went to search for him, worried that it may lead to war if anything happened. It was Barakiel that got closest to him, Akeno flinched at the name but said nothing, he found the rogue, a grunt named Lanakiel who was desperate for another war. Barakiel took him out of the sky but was unable to find Lucia's, and Lanakiel killed himself before he could be brought in for questioning. 
We were certain that he had died, but if what you are telling me is true, there is a chance, there is a chance that my baby is still alive. Grafia said tears in the corner of her eyes as she recounted the tale. So you are saying that this boy could be my nephew? Riaz asked, a little shocked at the story. I don't want to hope, but if he has both the power of destruction and lucifuge magic, then there is a high chance that he may well be. Grafia said. I do say, that's the name he goes by, if you want I can try and get you a chance to meet him and verify for yourself. Rhea said standing up. Thank you. Grafia said calming herself. And please, do not mention this to anyone else. I wouldn't want to get their hopes up before I know for certain. Understood. Rhea's looked down at her watch. Class is already finished for the day. Rhea's muttered as she created a magic circle to talk to her knight, knowing he would be out of class already. Tibba, I need you to get a say to come over to your place tonight. I don't care how you do it, sleep over, girls, horn, but do it. Kidnap him if you have to. Ria said into the circle. Yes Prez, Kibba responded uncertainly, but Ria's ended the connection before he could ask any questions. Grafia, we can meet with him tonight, would you like to clean yourself up? Ria's asked. I shall go and change, I will meet you at your night's abode shortly. Grafia said calmly. Despite the news she was still a maid in the Gremory household and she had to maintain her appearance. Later that day. So you said this friend of yours is a student at Kuo Academy? Issei said as he and Kiba walked down one of the corridors in the apartment building Kiba lived at. Yep, she's very smart and popular. She's in charge of the occult research club, so that's part of the reason that I'm going to be joining it. In fact she's the entire reason I'm joining it, Kiba said thoughtfully his words holding a deeper meaning than Issei knew. Uo, got a crush on her or something? Issei inquired playfully, a troublesome twinkle in his eye. Maybe I should leak the news to your fan club, that would certainly cause a reaction. He was grinning at the thought because seriously, who had a fan club dedicated to them in middle school? Shut up Dumbus, and please don't say anything inflammatory tonight, she and her family aren't the kind of people you want to be on the bad side of. Kiba warned smacking his friend playfully over the head. Got it, I'll keep my mouth shut. Issei said as he pantomimed zipping his lips. Kiba just rolled his eyes. Kiba unlocked the door and stepped inside, in his living room sat two women, a silver-haired lady in a white dress shirt and a grey dress skirt. Next to her was a red-haired girl in a Kuo Academy uniform. Issei had just enough time to take in the two's appearance, before a third girl entered the room from the kitchen carrying tea. She was also in a Kuo Academy uniform and had long black hair tied back in a ponytail. Ara, Ara you must be Issei. The black-haired woman said looking towards the door. Issei, this is Akeno Himejima, she's the vice president of the occult research club. Kiba said. Issei looked at her, nice to meet you. Rhea stood up and took a look at him, finally getting a good chance to sense the power within him, he was definitely a devil, although she couldn't be sure if he knew it, especially since he'd been raised by humans. I am Rhea's Gremory, it's a pleasure to meet you as well as say. The pleasure is mine. Issei said starting to struggle a little to avoid looking at her very large chest. He turned to look at the only woman who hadn't introduced herself. Grafia had been staring at him the entire time, unblinking. Her hands covered her mouth as tears ran down her face. When Issei looked at her she found herself running over to him and throwing her arms around him in a hug. Erm Issei started. This is Grafia Lucifuge, she's Kiba started to say before looking at his king for guidance, unsure of what was going on. I'm your mother, I can't believe I finally found you. Grafia said crying, a huge grin growing on her face. Mother? Issei asked in disbelief. Grafia backed away a little, tears still streaming down her cheeks, and a wide smile ran in between them. Summoning a magic circle she held it out so he could get a proper look at it. Seeing the symbol Issei's eyes widened in recognition at the symbol he saw every time he cast his ice magic. I'd know those eyes anywhere, I could feel it as soon as I saw you. As for proof, Grafia said, I already know you can make a magic circle like this one. Don't do any magic but make the circle at least. Issei did as the woman commanded, a little shocked that someone else could do magic other than him. Summoning magic to his hand he created the circle holding it out next to Grafia's. Every devil in the room could see that the two were identical. It's really you. I can't believe I finally found you. Grafia said pulling her son into another hug. Issei was shocked to say the very least. He was expecting to meet some high school girls tonight and learn about what high school would be like, not meet his biological mother. He pushed himself away from the woman, now claiming to be his mother. While the circles had shocked him he wasn't going to just believe a stranger immediately. He needed something that only his real parents would know, something he'd never told anybody, then it clicked. His other secret. Something he'd found out as a child and kept secret from even his adoptive parents out of fear. Okay, if you think I'm your son then prove it. There's something different about me. Something that other people don't have, and it's not magic. Not even my adoptive parents knew what it was. What is it? 
He'd expected a moment of hesitation, but Grafia only smiled wider while the girl, Rias let out a knowing chuckle. What had happened to be these? Grafia asked letting out her wings. Following her example Rias, Kiba and Akino did the same. You have them too? Issei asked a little shocked. Seeing them he let out his own pair too. He was shocked, he'd finally found others who knew what he was. Who he was. They were his family. He began to get mad, they were his family. If you're my mother, then how come you didn't raise me? How come I was found in a puddle of freezing water in the middle of a stormy night by a couple of humans? Why is it now, when I'm finally getting used to coming home to an empty house that you show up? Issei yelled angrily. He didn't know it, but he was crying, trying to figure out why he'd been cast away and abandoned. Was there something wrong with him? Did they not want him? If they didn't then why now did they come to claim him? You were stolen from us, I looked everywhere I could to find you. All of us did but there was no trace of you. We spent seven years searching, scouring every part of the world, following every tip, every lead. We moved heaven and hell to look for you, and we searched in both while we were at it, but there was nothing. It was like you'd vanished off the face of the earth. Eventually, we had to stop searching, but we never stopped hoping, dreaming that you were okay. Grafia pleaded with tears in her eyes at the look her son was giving her. The amount of pain she saw there physically hurt her heart. This is all too much, the magic, you being my mother, me being kidnapped. Just let me think for a minute. Issei said collapsing onto the couch. Let's just talk this out for a bit. Grafia hesitantly sat down next to him, unsure whether it would be appropriate to reach for him or not. Rias, you can go ahead and tell your brother. And thank you, you have no idea how much this means to me. Grafia said turning to her sister-in-law. I'll go and get my brother then, and hey, I get a new nephew to spoil out of it. It's not all bad for me. Rhea said making a magic circle on the floor. Kiba, Akeno come with me, we'll give them a chance to talk alone for a bit. Rhea said as she and her two servants took off. I can't believe any of this is really happening. Issei said. I have so many questions. Well I'll try to answer as many of them as possible. Is it alright if I call you Issei? Grafia said struggling to use his human name. It's fine. That's what all my friends call me, and you are my mother. He still hesitated saying it, but I want to know, what was the name you gave me? The name we gave you was Lucia's Lucifuge Gremory. Grafia said. Your father, my husband, Serzich's will be joining us soon. Hopefully, once he is here I can explain your family name a bit better. Well, um, how about we get to the elephant in the room, why is it that we can do magic? Issei asked putting a hand behind his head nervously. You might not want to hear this, but Grafia paused for a second. We aren't exactly human. Issei took it better than she expected, rolling his eyes. Obviously, we have freaking wings. But what are we? We're devils, there's a lot more to it than that, but the short version is we are the kinds of devils that they talk about in the Bible. Grafia clarified a grin still on her face. At least her son was coping well enough to be sarcastic with her. That explains why it hurt every time I was dragged to a church as a kid. Issei noted, shocking Grafia. Who dragged you into a church? Grafia yelled was a little furiously. If he was taken to a church then someone there could have recognized him as a devil, he could have been killed. Well there was this girl. Issei said his face blushing a bit. We were good friends when we were younger, but she had to move away a couple of years ago. Anyway, Grafia coughed to get back on topic. I've been told that your adoptive parents are already, um, you know. Yeah, they died earlier this year. It was a train wreck, there were a lot of people killed, guess they were just unlucky. Issei said his face turning downtrodden. Were they good people? Grafia asked hesitantly. The best. Issei said a light smile on his face, but sadness behind his eyes. It was at that point that another magic circle appeared on the floor. This time a man with red hair entered the apartment, his eyes darting around wildly. He noticed Grafia and Issei running over here wrapped both of them in a hug. I can't believe it's really you, she found you. The man said letting go to study Issei at arm's length, his eyes darting around wildly as he took in every detail. Issei, this is your father, Serzich's Lucifer, he is one of the four Satans currently ruling the underworld. Grafia said calmly. I'm gonna need a history lesson on this soon. Issei said sitting back down, his head hurting slightly at all the revelations he was experiencing in one night. We can get it sorted out later. Serzich said sitting down next to Grafia. He ran his hand through his hair nervously a habit Issei and him unknowingly shared. Sorry I just can't really believe it. After all this time you were right under our noses. It would be funny if it wasn't so sad. Under your noses? Issei asked. You know Kuo Academy, well I along with my mother are on the school board, so we are in this town quite a bit. Not to mention Rias and Sona attend the school here, so it's kind of impressive you managed to avoid us this long. Serzich said laughing a little. If we didn't find you this year then we would almost certainly have found you next year when you started attending. 
So what are we going to do now? Grafia asked her husband. Well we can't exactly kidnap Issei, but now that we have finally found him we aren't just going to leave him alone again. Serzichas said. The conversation between the three went well into the night and covered a variety of topics. From what they were going to do next as well as what Issei had been up to. It was decided that Issei would continue his life as normal for the most part. He would take the Lucifuge and Gremory names and move Haidu to his middle name, honoring the memory of his adoptive parents. Grafia agreed that he would need a considerable amount of training and education, and since he was already due to start a Kuo Academy, it was decided that Grafia would tutor him on the history of devils, the proper way to act as a high-class devil, society, and similar necessary things during the evening. Issei would continue to live in the Haidu home, although Serzich has promised to renovate it for him in the near future, but would need to meet with the rest of his family sometime soon. Issei also noted that his finances would be handled by the Grimmery family, and with his mother tutoring him, he would need to leave his job at the convenience store. He would miss Carolyn, but with everything going on now he didn't have a lot of brain power left to think of an excuse to give her, so he put off saying anything, and just didn't show up again. Waking up the day after he met his parents, Issei was worried that it might have been a dream. He checked his phone and saw the picture that he'd taken the night before staring back at him. Everything was real. He was a devil. He wasn't abandoned, he was kidnapped and most importantly, he had a family again. That last part was super important. Not being human was a shocker, but he'd known something was off ever since he'd first realized he'd had wings. He was still adjusting although it explained a lot as well, he was always a lot stronger than he looked, he was never really tired at night and could even see in the dark. Heck he got a headache every time he went near a temple or church, and the first time he'd said a prayer to the man upstairs was the last one. He went downstairs to the kitchen and fixed himself some breakfast. It was a weekend so he had the day off. Apparently he was going to be brought to meet with the rest of the family later today. Once Grafia showed up, Issei greeted her with a hug which caused her to lose her composure for a moment before she launched into her lecture on how to act today. First of all no wandering eyes, everyone you meet today is family. Second let us do most of the talking. Finally don't be afraid to ask questions, you are just being brought into the supernatural world, so ask away. Yes, mom, Issei said still struggling with a word although he was trying. But now let's look over what you'll wear today. Issue ended up in smart casual clothes. A simple red t-shirt with black jeans. Grafia created a magic circle in motion for Issei to join her. The two teleported to the Grimmery mansion and were met by Serzichas in the main hall. Noticeably absent were the servants who Serzichas had dismissed before their arrival. Hello father. Issei said tentatively, Serzichas was very well dressed in what appeared to be some kind of robe, he wouldn't have looked out of place as a final boss in a Vidigam Issei thought. Hello Issei, how are you feeling? Serzichas asked. Their conversation was strained at best, neither was quite sure how to act around the other. Suddenly being told that he had a family again was still messing with Issei's head, while Serzichas on the other hand had no idea what kind of person Issei was, although he was looking forward to getting to know him. Terrified. Issei admitted. Don't worry, you'll do fine. Serzichas assured his son resting a comforting hand on his shoulder, now come on let's not keep your grandparents waiting. Entering the dining room Issei stood tentatively behind his parents hidden from sight although he could see fine. He saw at the table two young looking women, a mature looking man and a young boy. The boy looked like Issei did when he was younger, except he had red hair like Serzichas. Issei recognized the red haired woman as Ria's, Kiba's master and his aunt. Which left him to assume that the last two were his grandparents. The man had the family's signature red hair, whereas his grandmother seemed to be where Issei got his brown hair from. Oh Serzichas, Grafia, what a surprise, we haven't had you two visit together for so long. The older woman said a smile on her face. Tell me is it for work or pleasure? Her face looking almost disappointed that they might answer with the former. A bit of both actually. For you see, we have some very, very good news. Serzichas said barely containing his excitement, a grin on his face he was unable to hide. For someone of his stature getting to not only see his family, but have good news to share when doing so was rare. Ria's had a very self-satisfied look on her face knowing of the announcement and her role in it. And judging by your sister's face I assume she knows about it already. The older man said a cheerful twinkle in his eye. Only because she was the one that found out first. She was the one that told me and Grafia about him. Serzich said dropping the first hint. Him? Venelana asked thinking through the possibilities in her head. She then noticed the power that Grafia and her son seemed to be trying to hide behind them. It felt so familiar to her. It couldn't be. She muttered shocked, placing her hands over her mouth as tears sprang to her eyes. What? Her husband asked noting her reaction. Ziodicus put down his cutlery and stood to pay full attention to the situation, his expression serious all cheerfulness gone in an instant. 
Yes, a while ago a particularly interesting person showed up when we were dealing with a stray devil. A devil pure-blooded that could control the power of destruction and cast high-tier ice magic. I approached Grafia yesterday about it and last night I had Kiba bring him along so we could meet him. Ria's explained a grin on her face as she shared the beginning of the story. Once I saw him I was almost brought to tears, you are correct in your assumption Lady Gremory, last night we found our son. Grafia said, keeping her composure but hiding a smile. She didn't want to admit that she'd cried at seeing him again, it didn't go with her reputation as the Ice Queen. Lucia's, you found him? Zeoctacus asked in shock, falling back heavily onto his chair, a hand raised to his forehead. Well he isn't going by that name anymore, allow me to introduce, Issei Gremory, our eldest son. Your older brother, Milikas. Serzicha said grinning triumphantly as he and Grafia stepped aside, unveiling Issei. Uh, hi. Issei said, giving an awkward wave to his family. His real one who he was meeting for the first time, at age 16. The family sat down and ate together, all interested in hearing Issei's tale. Issei explained how he was adopted by the Haidu family and that they had sadly died in a train wreck in the summer. He told them about his upbringing, his efforts to get into Kuo, and his training with magic on his own. He noticeably left out all the more perverted parts of his life, not wanting to make them think he was one even if it had been true. Eventually they reached the present and what would happen next. So Issei, you said you were going to be starting a Kuo next year correct? Zeoticus asked stroking his goatee thoughtfully. Yes, I already have everything sorted out, I just need to get the uniform and make it to the end of this year. Issei explained. Well we will need to make sure you meet with Sona before then, we want to avoid any misunderstandings once you get there. Zeotica said as he thought of all the things that would need to be done. She's the heiress of the Citri family, another high-class devil family, and controls the student council there. I can imagine they will want to know if we send another child along to the school. Actually we should probably make the rest of the devil world aware that we found him. Grafia reminded the family. Good point, but before that we will need to make sure that Issei gets a feel for the underworld. Can't make him the center of attention without him knowing what's what and who's who. Serzich has said. How would you feel about heading out tomorrow for a bit Issei? You and Grafia can head out and see the sights. Learn a bit about the underworld before you're thrown head first into it. That actually sounds like a lot of fun. It could be fun to just go and explore a little. Issei said eager to learn more and spend some time with his birth mother. Alright, then you and Grafia can head out tomorrow. Zeotica said. Which reminds me, do we have a room for Issei for the night? I already set one up ahead of time my lord. Grafia said with a slight bow. None of that right now, you are family and now is a time for celebration. Zeotica said. Lazarus, get the sake. A butler nodded and went to grab a bottle. Sake. Issei asked quietly. Riaz who was sitting on his right leaned over and whispered, most of the family are really into Japanese culture, dad particularly likes the drinks. Mom claims to not be interested, but I saw her reading a manga once and she seemed to be enjoying it. Milika's just started Drago soap ball. Ah. Issei exclaimed in understanding although he was a little confused about why devils would be interested in Japan, since most of them dressed like European nobles. The following day Issei woke up in the room that his mother had prepared for him in his grandparents' mansion. The room was almost as big as his own house. He remembered that he was supposed to head out with his mother today, so he went and got into the shower in his end-suite bathroom before getting into some casual clothes. Ones that were noticeably more expensive than what he'd worn yesterday. As he finished he heard a knock on the door. Hello. He called out. Issei, it's me. His mother responded. Oh, you can come in. Issei said. The door opened and she walked in dressed in her usual maid outfit. You're already dressed? She asked. It's still quite early in the morning. You could sleep more if you want. Yeah, I got up a while ago. It's probably due to the early hours I worked at the convenience store and since we're heading out today I figured I would just get ready. Issei explained. Well except for the servants you are the first one up. Grafia informed him. And you? Issei noted. Well I fall under servants since I am the headmate of the Gremory family. But I'm still your mother so don't think you can get mouthy with me. Grafia said, smiling a bit. Well, shall we get going? Issei asked hopefully. His stomach growled to inform him he still had to eat. Breakfast first. Grafia asked, raising an eyebrow at the sound. Good point, lead the way mom. Issei said. Grafia was taken aback by getting called mom, but she quickly buried it, hopefully things would keep going this well. After breakfast Issei and Grafia walked around town for a few hours. They went to a few famous historical sites and a museum giving Grafia a good chance to catch Issei up on the basics of devil history. The details would come later during their nightly lessons. After that they went to a mall so Issei could see the similarities and differences between devil and human culture. 
While they were walking around Issei and Grafia got separated from one another when Issei spotted a poster outside a movie theater that caught his eye. The next thing he knew he couldn't see Grafia anywhere. Not only that he couldn't call her or anyone else, since he only had Kiba's phone number and he was in Japan so he wouldn't be of any help. Issei was turned around and a little lost when a voice called out to him. You there. A young girl's voice called to him in an aggressive tone. Issei turned towards the direction of the voice, and he saw a girl, about a year younger than him, with blonde hair in the shape of two drills going down the side of her head. She was wearing a red aristocratic dress and was pointing at him aggressively. You are to accompany me. The girl demanded walking over to Issei. Accompany you? Issei asked confused. Yes, the fool at the desk over there said I am too young to see this movie, but if I had someone accompanying me, it would be fine. To meet his demands you will take me to see the movie. The girl said with a smirk at her own genius. Don't you have any family you can ask? Issei said. W they are all very busy right now so I need to see it myself. The girl said with a huff. Well what's the movie about? Issei asked unsure. He would rather kill himself than go to some pony flick with a princess who makes friends with all the birds through the course of a music number and judging by the one he was asking that looked like the kind of thing she'd be into. You haven't heard of it yet? The girl asked clearly shocked. No. It's the third time they made this story into a movie, it's based on the true story of Serzich's Lucifer and Grafia Lucifuge and how they first fell in love. The girl explained. Seriously? Issei asked in disbelief, a grin growing at the thought. You've never heard of it. It's the most popular love story in the underworld. The girl said holding her hands prayer style while a love-struck look appeared in her eyes. Well I've gotta see it now. Issei said with a grin before remembering. But I don't have any money. Then how about this, I buy you a ticket and you come see it with me so we can both watch it. The girl offered. That would be awesome. I'm Issei by the way. He said extending a hand towards the girl careful to avoid saying his last name. Well then Issei san, I am Ravel Phoenix. The girl, now called Ravel, shook it. After paying the two entered the theater. As the two were watching the movie Issei watched in awe at the magic used to make the actors look identical to their real life counterparts. So it's all come down to this Grafia Chan. Serzicha said as the two got into battle positions in a destroyed city. Indeed, Gremory, I must say you have proven to be quite tenacious. No other devil has faced me this many times and lived to tell the tale. Grafia said as she began creating a magic circle. The two began casting spell after spell as ice spears launched endlessly at Serzicha's, who used his power of destruction to decimate them before they could reach him. You know, we don't need to fight like this. Serzicha's offered, a troublemaker grin similar to Issei's on his face. Of course we do traitor. Grafia said, doubling the number of spells she was casting. You could always just lose and become my wife instead. Serzich's countered with a smirk causing his opponent to blush and falter for a moment. Seeing the opening, Serzich's rushed forward and stole a kiss which the pair sank into as the battle raged in the background. Issei had to give his father props for both his choice in women, as well as the sheer size of his family jewels, to be able to do such a thing. Issei fervently hoped he had inherited his father's abilities. The final scenes consisted of the two working together in order to finish off the old Satan faction and their eventual wedding. After that the credits began to roll. Issei looked to his side and guessed from Ravel's grin that she had clearly loved the movie. So I'm guessing you enjoyed yourself. Issei asked as they walked down the aisle. It was good, but the final fight was better in the original. Ravel said breaking the movie down for him. They even stole the line verbatim. I'll need to watch it some time. Issei noted before holding the door for her. Come on, you ready to leave. Once the two left the movie theater it was around dinner time and Issei decided he should probably look for his mother. He took out his phone but remembered that the only devil whose number he had wouldn't be useful in the current situation. Fortunately the crowd had died down a bit so he tried to look for his mom. What are you doing with my sister? A loud and angry voice called from behind Issei. He turned and saw a tall man with blonde hair storming over to him. The loud voice drew attention to them as most onlookers turned to see what was causing the commotion. Bani Sama, what are you doing here? Ravel asked. Looking for you? Mom and Dad said you went out. The man said, grabbing the front of Issei's shirt. Who is this worm, did he lay a hand on you? I am Issei Issei attempted to introduce himself when suddenly a massive flaming orb was thrust in his face. I didn't ask you worm. The man said when all of a sudden a freezing chill came over them both. The flame died as the man turned towards the origin of the chill. There you are Issei. A relieved but angry voice came from nearby. The three devils turned and saw Grafia walking over looking displeased, the crowd parting for her like the Red Sea to Moses. The woman had a cheerful grin on her face, although all three devils could see that it didn't reach her eyes. Simultaneously three gulps could be heard. Grafia-san, to what do I owe the pleasure? 
The man asked his voice respectfully calm as he shivered slightly. Riser Phoenix, I would ask you to unhand my son. Grafia said her smile still plastered on her face, Riser complied though he looked shocked at the news. Your son? Ravel said shocked as she looked between Grafia and Issei, the later of whom was grinning sheepishly as he rubbed the back of his head. Indeed, Issei Lucifuge Gremory, myself and Serzich's eldest son. Grafia explained, now then, Issei it's time we got back, don't you agree? Issei nodded and followed after his mother, before turning turning back to wave goodbye to Ravel, who couldn't help but move her mouth up and down in shock. I'll talk to you later Ravel, thanks for the movie. Issei got a stern talking to from Grafia once they got back to the mansion, but he had to get back to Earth, so he explained what happened to his parents, who were both embarrassed to find out the son had seen the movie based on them. Issei played video games with Milikas a bit, but he eventually headed home. Some good did come from the confrontation though, Issei and Ravel became quick friends. They met up so he could watch her copy of the original and first remake of the movie. After that the two kept meeting to watch other movies, mostly romances since that was what Ravel enjoyed the most. Issei kept watching because he enjoyed hanging out with Ravel, and he was learning a lot about devils from watching the movies. When Issei returned to school after reuniting with his family things changed almost immediately. Within a week they had been able to change his name and officially register him as their son. He supposed the devils had more connections than he had first assumed. More than a few people asked him about the sudden name change, but he simply said that he had met his birth family and that they had been looking for him for years. A few people started rumors that he was doing it for attention, but they were quickly snuffed out by none other than Kiba. Some girls were talking about it, and Kiba mentioned that he'd been there when Issei met his mother. After hearing it from the school prince the girls were all down with the change. Issei also decided that with a new name would come a new him, so he rounded up all of his old erotic magazines and began to burn them, but not before looking through them one last time. He also took the time to read any books he could find that related to the supernatural. While some of it was obviously made up he was able to learn quite a bit. His lessons on devil society in the evenings with Grafia went by faster than he expected, but there was one part in particular that stuck out to him. So high-class devil males will sometimes take multiple wives in order to ensure heirs. Issei asked his mother a little shocked. Yes, though your father and grandfather only love one woman, some will take multiple in order to ensure heirs. While others will just simply claim women as their own in order to build a harem. One example is Riser Phoenix, Ravel's elder brother. His peerage is filled with 14 women, all of whom are bound to follow his will no matter what. This man is Rhea's fiancé, unfortunately. Raphia set a look of distaste on her face she failed to hide. If he's so bad then why is she marrying him? Issei asked blankly. The Gremory family and the Phoenix families seek to bring their families closer together, and an engagement between two of their children is the best option. Unfortunately Riser's brother has no interest in taking a second wife, and me and your father refuse to have either you or Milikas be married to someone you don't love. We also don't want to force poor little Ravel into marrying someone she doesn't love, even if we know for a fact you and Milikas are far better than Riser. Isn't there some way that she can get out of it? Issei asked, looking deep in thought. Well the contract does state that if she or a champion of her choice can beat Riser or a champion of his choice in a raiding game, then she can dissolve the engagement, but Riser is extremely powerful, so the chances of that happening are near zero. Grafia said, looking a little dejected. The week before he started high school Issei was taken to have his evil pieces set up, and by the time he was walking into Kuo Academy, he was officially a high-class devil. The first thing he had to do was meet with the student council president and his aunt. Ah Issei, welcome. Kiba said opening the door for him as he entered the occult research club. Thank you. Issei said taking a seat on the sofa facing Sona. Alright, thanks for coming, let's begin our meeting. First up on the agenda is ground rules for peerage recruiting. Issei you have your evil pieces now, yes? Riaz asked. Issei nodded his confirmation. Alright, whenever one of us finds a potential member we need to inform the others in order to avoid disputes. Sona if it's alright with you, I would like to give this a priority if there is anyone he wishes to use his queen piece on. It being the most important piece I would like to make sure that neither of us stop him from getting his first choice for the position. Ria said. That sounds fair. Sona conceded. She didn't like the idea of someone sweeping in and stealing Tsubaki from her, so she accepted the rule on a moral point. Thank you very much, are there any prospects either of you already have your eye on? Issei asked respectfully. Glad you asked. I'm keeping an eye on a boy in your year by the name of Saji. I'll see how he acts in school and I'll have my decision in a month or so. Sona said. Understood both Grimmery said making mental notes that he was off the table, for now. I've not got my eye on anyone in particular at the moment. Ria said dejectedly. Issei shot his aunt a sympathetic grin. 
Now that he knew her situation he knew that she needed all the peerage members she could get. But she already had members, he was starting from nothing, so he thought he had the right to be a little selfish when it came to recruitment. He was a devil after all. Got it. Issei said. Now with regards to devil work. Sona said taking out a few sheets of paper. Rias will assist you with contracts and summons until you get a familiar. Sona put a color-coded chart down, showing how the city was divided up currently between the two kings, before laying a second down, showing how it would look in the future, when Issei had gathered a few pieces. As for strays, both of us will take you on hunts so you can gain some experience. We take alternative shifts on hunting strays, and we will each take you on half of them, expect about one every two weeks or so. Once you've got enough peerage members we'll include you in the cycle too. Sona said taking out another paper. Finally you will need to form a club in order to have your peerage be close by without drawing attention. Sona handed him a club application form, under activities other was already selected. You don't need to turn it in now, but once you have two or more servants it'll probably start to matter. Just bring it to me whenever you're ready. Alright then, I need to get going, but I'll talk to you two later. Issei said getting up and heading for the door. Issei was one of the last ones to get to his classroom, meaning that he didn't get much choice when it came to his seat. There were two spots left, one near the window in the back of the room, and one in the third row near the door. Issei decided to head for the window seat since it was closer to where he sat in junior high and was far enough back that he would feel comfortable enough to sneak in a nap if needed. Once Issei sat down the last missing student, Kiba, entered. Not that it surprised Issei much, but the second he entered he could hear almost every girl in the class collectively gasp. What did give him a bit of a surprise was the lack of reaction from the girl adjacent to him, he turned to take a quick look at her, and to his surprise, it was one of his classmates from junior high, Kaori Murayama. She was one of the few girls in junior high who he never noticed focusing on Kiba as much as the rest of the girls in their class. She and Issei never really got along great what with him being one of the big three perverts in the school, but ever since he stopped hanging around with them, she seemed less intimidating when she looked at him. A part of Issei wanted to say hi to her, but he figured it would be pushing his luck a little, and he didn't want to start any rumors about himself on the first day. After class Kiba and Issei were making their way to their lockers and chatting away. So have you taken notice of anyone yet? Kiba asked. I tried doing that thing my father taught me about sensing potential sacred gears in people. I got a hit, but I'm not sure at the moment. I might ask Rias about it, maybe she can help me come to a conclusion. Issei responded. Not a bad idea, I'm pretty sure she would happily help you out if you aren't sure. You need to be careful with your servants, you only have 15 pieces, and you only get to use them once. Kiba reminded him as they reached their lockers. Issei opened his first and the letter dropped out. Wow, someone's Kiba began taunting Issei as he opened his locker. To both their shock at least 30 letters came tumbling out. Damn, that's some impressive work pretty boy. Issei said nudging a stray letter back onto the pile at the pair's feet. Well at least I'll have an excuse for not responding to all of these, it would be in bad taste for you to ignore yours however. Kiba said pointing at the letter in Issei's hand. Go on, I'll tell Prez you'll be along later to talk with her. Kiba said picking up the letters as he left for the old clubhouse. Issei, as per the instructions he found inside the letter was now behind the kendo hall. He was to meet the sender after the club let out, so he assumed that whoever sent it was probably in the club. While he waited he sat with his back to the wall quietly playing with his ice magic, making sculptures and models. After about half an hour he gets around to making jewelry with it. He made a few pretty intricate necklaces, and eventually made a ring. Marriage huh? Issei thought to himself as he looked the piece over. He considered himself lucky that his parents hadn't arranged a political marriage for him like Ria's. He thought back to what his mom had told him earlier, it's not uncommon for devils to have harems, I may end up having multiple wives one day. Issei thought a slight perverted smile on his face. Maybe he'd end up living his childhood dream one day, the same dream that made him an outcast, he only had three friends after he began saying that out loud, Mitsuda, Motohama and. As Issei's thoughts moved to his childhood friend he was dragged back to reality by a shout from nearby. Looks like we caught a pervert trying to peek at the changing rooms. A pink-haired girl in her uniform was standing at the corner of the building looking at him a training sword over her shoulders. Issei quickly melted the ice in his hand and stood up. Hello there. Issei said calmly, putting his hand behind his back to hide any stray ice or water while he held the other out. Don't act coy, I know you were trying to peek at us. Why else would you be here? The woman said, two more members of the club moved behind her to back her up, much to Issei's amusement. Wait a second that's not it at all, I got a letter telling me to meet someone here, so I'm waiting for them to show up. Issei explained retracting his hand. You'll forgive me for being skeptical. The girl said a look of doubt clear on her face. Issei took the note out from his pocket and walked over to the girls with it outstretched. 
The pink-haired girl grabbed it out of his hand and opened it up, giving it a quick red. Well, it seems you're not a liar after all. But, are you sure this is real, I mean it's the first day, what are you expecting? The pink-haired girl said handing the note back. I'm not sure, I doubt it's a confession or something similar. As you said it's the first day and I'm no kibba. But someone wanted me to meet them here and that's what I plan to do. Well, then Gremory I guess I'll see you around. The pink-haired girl said leaving with the other two girls. Shortly after the three left another girl rounded the opposite corner and snuck up behind to say. Hello there, hi Gremory. The girl behind Issei said. He recognized her voice immediately, this was Mureyama, he expected it might be her, given that they were meeting at the kendo club room, after the club ended, and she was the only girl from junior high that he had met so far. Mureyama, hey, were you the one who sent the letter? Issei asked calmly turning around to face the brunette. Yes I was actually, I wanted to know. Mureyama was starting to look down a little, and she had a slight blush dusting her cheeks. What made you change? Change? Issei asked, genuinely confused by what she meant. The name, stopping your perverted behavior, hanging out with popular people like Kiba, I hardly recognize you from before. After summer everything started changing, then suddenly one day you change your name, and you seem happier than you've ever been before. Murayama said looking away from him. Well, I stopped hanging out with Matsu and Moto, because both of them were busy studying, and since they weren't going to come here, I started hanging out with Kiba, since he was also gonna go here with me. I would have asked to get to know you or some of the other girls better, but I figured that with my reputation from the previous years, it would be better to talk with a guy instead. Issei explained with his hand behind his head sheepishly. As for the name change, Kiba was introducing me to some of his friends who would be in the year above us at Kuo, the two in charge of the occult research club, and when I got there they had another woman there, my biological mother. When she saw me she was convinced that I was actually her kidnapped son, and we ended up doing a test to confirm it. After that I met with the rest of my family. Long story short I'm from the same family as the president of the orc, Ria's Gremory. I'm actually her nephew, and I took up the family name, but kept my given name in memory of my adoptive parents. Issei finished explaining and put his hands in his pockets. Is that all you wanted from me? That'll do for today. Hayu Gremory, Murayama said. Just call me Issei, it'll be easier for you to remember. Issei said taking off. Later Murayama. Hayori Murayama commanded at Issei's retreating backside. Huh? Issei said turning back to look at her. If I'm going to call you Issei then you have to call me Kaori. Kaori said. Alright then, later Kaori, I'll see you in class tomorrow. Issei said taking off for the orc. Kaori quickly ran behind him and hugged him from behind, startling Issei. Just so you know, I like this you a lot better than the old one. She said quickly running off. Issei stood frozen in shock, for two reasons. One he was just hugged by a girl, of her own free will, and the other was the power he had just felt coming off of her. It was definitely a sacred gear. He wasn't sure what it was, but he knew that she would certainly be a good person to make his. Time skip. Issei entered the occult research club and greeted the members. Hello everyone. Kiba and Akeno immediately walked over and began probing him from the sofa he'd lazily thrown himself down on. Ara, Ara to think that our little Issei is turning into a ladies man. Oh what's a girl to do? Akeno in tone bringing a hand to her cheek for dramatic effect. So, any luck with that love letter? Kiba inquired a grin on his face. I guess, the girl who sent it knew me in junior high and wanted to ask what happened to make me change so much. Issei said. But she's also the one who I mentioned earlier. Issei finished looking at Kiba pointedly. The one with the sacred gear? Kiba said now serious. Yeah, I'm sure. I don't know what it is though, is there any way to find out? Issei asked, this time to Ria's who was looking on at her nephew trapped between her knight and queen. Unless you can get it to awaken I highly doubt that you will learn what it is. Best to keep an eye on her. Can you give me her name, so that me and Sona can mark her off as potentially yours for now? Ria's asked resting her chin on her interwoven hands. It's Kaori Murayama. Issei responded. Alright, I'll let Sona know. Ria said making a magic circle with her hand to contact her friend. Later that night the orc plus Issei went out to hunt a stray devil. There was a stray going around sexually assaulting girls walking around late at night. That would be bad enough if it was a human doing it, but this former bishop was using hypnosis in order to make the girls do it with their own free will, then left them with the memories of what happened. Quite a few had suffered mental breakdown afterwards, and more than a few suicides had been blamed on the creature. The team had tracked him to an abandoned building, formerly a sports shop which he had lured a girl into minutes earlier. We need to get started sooner rather than later, every second we waste is a second he could be assaulting that girl. Issei said anxiously. 
this was his first stray hunt and it was rather intimidating, but knowing what this monster was doing certainly made him feel better about what they were there to do. Alright, then let's enter, Kaneko you have point, Kiba watch our flanks, Issei, you, me, and Akeno are the main firepower. Rhea's ordered and the team moved towards the building. When they got to the door Kaneko took the door down with a single strike. Knock knock. She deadpanned as the door flew to the other side of the building clattering as it hit the ground. I think you're supposed to do that before you knock the door down, Issei said as he walked past her into the room. When he entered Issei turned on the lights and was shocked with what he saw. Before him was the stray devil. It had taken the form of a very fat man in a greasy tight-fitting shirt and boxers. The shirt failed to cover the stray's enormous girth, so the entire group was treated to his hairy outie. But what shocked Issei was the brown-haired girl in a Kuo Academy uniform. Kaori. Issei whispered. This was the girl who'd sat next to him in class, the girl who had hugged him earlier that very same day. The one who he had decided to tell everything to and hoped that she would become friends with him, the real him, the devil him. This disgusting stray was standing over her and trying to claim her as his. When Issei spoke the devil turned its gaze from Kaori and looked at the group of devils there to kill him. Growling he retreated into a back corner leaving Kaori who turned to face them. There was a yellow glow to her eyes and a blankness to her stare that chilled Issei to his core. Careful she's under hypnosis, Kaneko restrain her. Rhea's ordered. The small white-haired girl nodded and rushed Issei's classmate. Kaori drew her shinai and struck Kaneko along the side of her face so fast that it actually left a cut. Kaneko attempted to push her against the wall, but Kaori jumped over the younger girl's head. Kaneko quickly recovered from her collision with the wall and turned to face Kaori again, but found her enemy already attacking her. Kaneko took an extra strike, this time along her arm, and then attempted to strike again, but this time her attack took far longer to hit than before and was easily sidestepped by Kaori. What's going on, she's far too fast for a regular human. Kiba said worriedly. I've got this. Kaneko protested, but she was far more sluggish. She shouldn't be nearly this tired fighting one mind-controlled human. Perhaps it's her sacred gear? Issei offered. That is a possibility. Is it somehow slowing down Kaneko or speeding her up? Kiba wondered. Issei shook his head in understanding both. It's draining the speed from Kaneko every time she hits her and giving it to her. Kaneko fought back. Kiba your Rias was about to give an order when Issei ran at the hypnotized girl. I've got this. Issei said confidently creating a magic circle underneath Kaori encasing the girl's shoes in ice, trapping the girl. He then grabbed her shinai mid-strike and sent a small amount of destruction into the blade breaking it, leaving her trapped and unarmed. Issei walked back from Kaori and watched her pointlessly try to reach them. That should hold her until we can take down the target. Issei said. Quick thinking Issei, I'm impressed. Ria said. The group walked towards the back of the building and found the stray trying to teleport away, but Akeno's lightning interrupted the circle, breaking it. The stray attempted to move towards the window, but found Kiba blocking his way. There is no escape for a runaway like you. For your crimes as well as your actions against the women of this town I, Ria's Gremory condemn you to death. She ordered launching a beam of destruction at the stay. However as the strike was on its way Kaori, now barefoot ran and jumped into its path taking the hit instead. Issei in a moment of shock, anger, and clarity, charged in and destroyed the stray himself, pooling the power of destruction like he had seen Rias do previously. He annihilated the disgusting creature so that not even a hair of it was left. When Issei came back to his senses he looked to the other devils who had laid Kaori down, while Akeno and Rias tried fruitlessly to heal her. There was a large gash on her stomach from where Rias' attack had struck her, and even from a few feet away, Issei could tell it was a mortal wound. Issei, what are you doing here? Kaori asked as Issei walked over to her. It seemed the death of the stray had broken his hypnosis control on her. I should be the one asking you that question. Issei responded softly. I was walking home from the store when I heard a voice asking for help. I looked in the window and then I couldn't control my body. I ended up attacking you guys and then Issei stopped me, but, but, she began to break down crying. I'm going to die now aren't I? She asked. I finally had a chance to get to know the real you, Issei and I'm going to die. How stupid is that? She wheezed out and attempted a laugh. Issei was crying as well at this point. He wiped his eyes you don't have to. Issei said summoning his evil pieces to him. I can save you, but, Issei gulped preparing for the worst. If I do so, you won't be human anymore. If you're trying to comfort me it's fine. I I'm just glad that I was oh oh once again able to see the real you. The boy I fell in I'll love Kaori whispered her last words to softly for anyone to hear as she passed away in Issei's arms. Flashback first day of middle school. Kaori Murayama was running late. She'd decided to stay late at kendo practice last night and had been too tired to wake up on time. 
She ended up rushing out of the house with a piece of toast in her mouth like some kind of an I'm girl. She'd ended up eating it too quickly and gave herself the hiccups. When she got to class she took a seat in the second to back row, one seat away from the window and next to a messy brown haired boy. She turned to introduce herself to him hello there, my name is Ka Hiccup Ori Murayama. She blushed and was about to look away embarrassed, but before she could he whirled to face her. Boo. He said loudly giving her a shock. Acting on pure reflex, Kaori punched him in the face. What was that for? She asked angrily as he reeled backwards clutching his nose. I thought it might help your hiccups. The boy groaned a weak smile on his face despite the pain. I miss say by the way, nice to meet you too. Thanks, I guess. Hey that actually worked. She put her hand to her throat and was shocked that his stupid idea had worked. Between the creative solution and the honest attempt to help her first impression of Issei was a pretty good one, she thought he was funny and at least a little kind. However it wasn't until a year later in their second year when she started to have feelings for him. It was a hot summer day and she was just finishing her kendo training for the day. Once she got outside the heat wave really hit her like a truck. She turned to go but heard a rustle behind the club and reluctantly went to check on the peepers. Issei had revealed his true nature along with his friends, Mitsuda and Motohama, the three were known as the perverted trio, hated by most every girl in the school. As much as she hated it, Kaori did need to concede that she was a little flattered that they chose to peep on her and her club out of all the girls, especially since they were the club that was most capable of beating the crap out of them. As she walked around to the usual spot that they would peep from the trio began to scramble. Like usual Mitsuda and Motohama pushed Issei down as they stood up, hoping to use him as a sacrificial pawn. Once the two started running Kaori got ready to pursue them when she felt a rush to her head and fell over from heatstroke. Between the intensive training and the heatwave it was a miracle she'd made it this far. She expected to hit the floor, but instead the last thing she felt was a pair of cold arms catch her before she hit the ground. The next thing she knew she woke up in the nurse's office, as she opened her eyes, she felt the pleasant coldness of an ice pack on her forehead. She turned to her right and was shocked to see Issei sat there with a smile on his face. You had me worried there Murayama, are you sure doing training in this weather is the best idea? I know more than half the club skipped today because of the heat. He said holding a grape soda out to her. She took it and was impressed with how cold it was, he must have gotten pretty lucky when he'd bought it. Did you bring me here? She asked. He nodded in response, just as well those two took off. It would have taken far longer to get you here if they were slowing me down, begging to take advantage of the situation. She furred her brow. And you didn't do anything to me whilst I was unconscious. Of course not, you passed out suddenly. I was a too busy worrying to mess with you, besides I've said before, I'd only do something like that with someone willing. He said backing up palms out in an attempt to pacify her. She opened the drink and took a sip. Thanks. She said quietly. I'll get going then, see you in class. He said as he took off. That seemed out of character for him Kaori thought to herself as she watched him walk out of the room. Then she thought back to how he had acted in their first year, before he started hanging out with those two friends of his. This was more like how he would act before then. It was almost as if without those two he was kinder, more empathetic, more romantic. She shook her head, where did that come from? Romantic, she was determined to never let herself think of the pervert as romantic again. Except she did, far more often than she would admit even to herself. It didn't feel like a crush though, not until after that fateful summer, when he got back from vacation, he was very different from the boy that had left. He was taller sure, and he looked a bit more manly as well. She thought he had done weights or some heavy lifting during the break. She found out from her mother that his parents had died during the vacation, it stung her more than hearing that a classmate's parents had died probably should have. It was tragic sure, but it's not like they were particularly close. Her official excuse was that she was just empathetic, but in the depths of her subconscious, a part of her was silently whispering shame you'll never get a chance to meet his parents. She tried her hardest to not think about him as much, but her mind kept on pushing her further and further away from her attempts at indifference to her classmate. He stopped peeping with his friends, it was then that she decided finally to repair the peephole that they had been using for years, to protect the first years. Once Kiba transferred in and became friends with him, a deep dark part of her was yelling that she should have asserted her supremacy and claimed him when he was at his lowest. That she could have taken him and made him the perfect man for her. She did what she could to ignore it, at least until she started to see the changes happening to say, he was acting less and less like a pervert every day. Then he changed his name, it was like he was trying to reinvent himself or something, like he wanted to stop being who he was before and show everyone that he was the boy she'd met on that day years ago. The same boy who'd scared her hiccups away in an attempt to help a girl in need, his damsel in distress. Though she never admitted it to everyone, she finally agreed to what her heart seemed to know for much longer than her head, she was in love. Back to present. Damn it. 
Issei shouted tears in his eyes. Rhea's peerage took a step back at the waves of power flowing off of him. Even if he was new to it he was a high-class devil, and aside from Rhea's all the others were low-class. Even Akeno who just earned her middle-class status, found herself struggling to stand up straight, while Kiba and Kaneko were almost on their knees due to the pressure. Issei Rias tried to talk to her nephew, but he wasn't paying attention. Issei. She shouted this time, and succeeded in getting his attention. Her knees almost buckled as the pressure was turned towards her, I get that this might not be how you wanted to do things, but the pieces will still work. Even post-mortem you can revive a person as a devil. It's how I got Kiba to join my peerage, though you'll have to ask him for the details. I can still save her. Issei asked disbelief in his voice, the power around him lowered as he calmed down, leaving the others out of breath. Yes, just take one of your pieces, since she's a swordswoman, perhaps a knight piece. Rhea suggested leading him on. It was his first time and as an experienced woman it was her responsibility to guide him through the process. Issei took out the blood red chess piece and placed it on his classmate's chest and began chanting, still holding her in his arms, I, Issei Grimory stand before you. This soul you claim is not yet yours to take. Kaori Murayama is to be my knight, the one who acts as my sword and shield. Now shatter the chains of death and give her back to me. When he finished the knight slowly sank into her chest. Then a moment later Kaori opened her eyes and looked up at Issei. You aren't getting away that easily. Issei set a grin on his face as he used the back of his hand to wipe tears from his eyes. Good. Was all she said in response before falling asleep in his arms. Apparently dying and being brought back to life really took it out of you. Kaori Murayama woke up in the morning the same time as she always did, at 5.43. This gave her two minutes to get to the shower, ten minutes to shower, five to get dressed, followed by an hour of training before eating breakfast and heading to school. Her body clock had this down pat so even after a night with such an intense dream, she was certain that she would be up at the right time. She opened her eyes and took in her surrounding. Then she screamed. What's wrong? Issei said as he rushed into his spare bedroom where he'd left Kaori the night before. He could have dropped her off at her parents, but he wasn't actually sure where she lived. He did however use her phone to call her parents and with some careful explanation and a bit of magical suggestion. He convinced them that she was fine and just had wanted to have an impromptu sleepover with an old friend of hers. Where am I? What am I doing here? What are you doing? She was panicking. Here she was in a bed she didn't recognize, with her crush standing in the doorway. Alright calm down, what is the last thing you can remember? I'll explain the rest from there, but first you should come and get some breakfast. Issei said calmly and threw her a spare girl's uniform. They might be a little big, they're my aunts after all but they should do. Your clothes were a bit damaged last night. At this point Kaori realized that she was actually not wearing anything, something that she would need to grill Issei about when he was explaining everything, but for now she did as she was told and got dressed, after he left of course. When she was presentable she walked downstairs and followed the smell into the kitchen, where she saw a silver-haired woman making scrambled eggs and bacon. Issei was at the table reading a copy of The Art of War. Now she had even more questions than before, she entered the room and took a seat at the table across from Issei. Issei, switch with me. Everything's almost ready and I need to introduce myself to our guest. The maid called. Issei nodded and closed the book exchanging places with the silver-haired beauty. Good morning, I am Grafia Lucifuge, Issei's mother, it's a pleasure to meet you. The woman in the maid costume said. The pleasure is all mine ma'am. Kaori responded out of habit. The entire thing felt a little surreal. All right, food's ready. Issei said placing a plate in front of each of the women, before grabbing a third and placing it down and taking a seat himself. Now Mer Kaori, what is the last thing you can remember from last night? Issei asked. Well I remember walking home from the store, then I looked in the window of that abandoned shop when I heard a cry for help. After that my body started acting on its own and I walked into the store. Then you, Kiba, and three girls all walked in as well, and, I think I fought the smaller girl, after that you broke my sword and stuck my shoes to the floor. Yes yeah, sorry, they are kinda damaged after that. Issei said putting a hand behind his head as he nodded at her to continue. Then I remember working my feet out of my shoes and socks and rushing into the next room. After that it's all blank. Kaori finished her account of the events and then looked to Issei, what happened, how did I end up at your house? Well after you entered the other room you jumped in front of an attack that was about to hit the guy that mind controlled you. I finished the guy off, then I went over to check on you. Issei gulped worried about how she would take the next bombshell. You were bleeding out. I saw it myself, there was a massive gash in your stomach, and you, Kinda, died. Kaori gasped at the news. I'm dead? Kaori asked, more shocked than confused. We're, we're dead, I revived you, as a devil. Issei finally came out and said it. As a what? She stood up, accidentally unleashing her devil wings as she did so. 
A A A A H H. What are these? Wings. I have wings. The wings of A. The devil. Grafia spoke up given that she was the best among them to explain devil history. Specifically the kind detailed in the Bible. Long ago there was a great war between devils, angels, and fallen angels, in the aftermath we devils were left with a great deal fewer numbers, and with low birth rates, we had to come up with a new way to increase our forces, so we invented these. The saint took out his evil pieces and placed a knight on the table in front of them. Evil pieces. They are used by devils to reincarnate other beings as devils, they are given to high-class devils, and Issei being a member of the Grimory family, holds the right to create a peerage of devil servants, you are the first that he has reincarnated. So I'm his slave now? Kaori asked sounding rather annoyed by the prospect. Technically, but that's not really how I wanted my peerage to be, I wanted mine to be more like Ria's or dad's, trusted friends, those close to me. Issei said calmly. Don't forget that your father ended up marrying his queen. Grafia said in a moment of mischief that belied her ice queen exterior. She thoroughly enjoyed the two blushing teenagers that she beheld at her statement. So these, evil pieces, could you explain them a bit more? Kaori asked. Sure, every devil who gets them gets fifteen pieces, a queen, two knights, two bishops, two rooks and eight pawns. Issei explained showing the box with all his remaining pieces to Kaori. Just like chess. Kaori noted out loud. Yep. Issei said. So I'm a knight then? Kaori asked. Yep, I figured that since you are a swordswoman you might like the extreme speed boost that comes from the knight piece, on top of the greatly increased stamina and strength that comes with being a devil. Issei said, grabbing the last piece of bacon on his plate. One last thing. From the report that Rias gave me, whenever you struck Kaneko, her rook, you seemed to sap the speed from her. Issei already thought that you might be in possession of a sacred gear before last night, and given what you managed to do as a normal human fighting against a devil, it has become clear that you certainly do have one. Grafia said. I'm guessing that you were ignorant of this, but please could you try and activate that power you used last night. It should come to you easier now that you've used it once before. Kaori closed her eyes and tried to imagine something, whatever it was that gave her the speed she had last night. Suddenly she felt something, a massive burst of power coming from her shoulder blades. Looks like it is as Lord Beelzebub predicted, momentum pillage, this sacred gear is one of the fragments of the White Dragon Emperor. I'll explain more later, but for now all you'll need to know is that this will let you steal half of an enemy's speed when you strike them and give it to yourself. This will mean that combined with the knight's power, you will be able to reach speeds you never thought possible. Now speaking of speed you should probably hurry and get to school. Grafia said. Kaori and Issei turned to look at the clock, and sure enough they had managed to spend almost an hour talking all of this through, and they needed to get to school quickly. The two teens quickly rushed out of the house and took off for the school. Kaori immediately noticed some of the major changes from yesterday, she was able to run flat out from Issei's house all the way to the school without feeling tired at all, once she made it there. When they got there they still had 10 minutes till the first bell, so they had time to talk a little in private. In case it wasn't obvious yet, keep the whole devil thing a secret. Issei said. Also when we let out for lunch meet up with me and Kiba. Alright then, what should I tell people if they ask about us arriving at school together? Kaori asked. I'll let you come up with something. Issei said taking off and dispersing a group of girls cornering Kiba at his locker. Hey man, how you holding up? Issei asked. I should be asking you that, you're the one that brought a girl home last night. Kiba taunted. Issei could feel the stares from a lot of people in that moment. After the shock of waking up in my spare room wore off, she took the news of what happened better than I expected, but I'll tell you the rest later. Issei responded as the pair made their way to the classroom and away from the glares, aimed at one of the pair's backsides. Time skip. At lunch Issei, Kaori, and Yudo stood behind the occult research club building in a pretty out-of-the-way area. Looks like we have lost all of your stalkers at this point Casanova. Alright Kaori, you might have figured it out already, but Kiba here is also a devil, he's the same as you, a former human that was made into a knight. Seriously, you didn't use some devil magic to make all the girls fall for you did you? Kaori asked pointedly. If I did that love letter from yesterday would have ended up in my locker instead of Issei's Kiba joked, making Kaori blush. It wasn't anything like that, besides that's not why we are here, Kaori needs a sword. It doesn't need to be permanent, but she needs to having she can use at least temporarily. Issei said. Right, right. Kiba said before creating a pair of swords from the ground next to him. Like you I also have a sacred gear Murayama, my one is called Sword Birth, and it lets me create all kinds of demonic swords at will. Since you don't have a weapon yet we are going to design one here. Try each of these out and tell me what you think. Kaori got over the shock of seeing the swords come out from the ground and picked one of them up. It was fairly long and was far heavier than Kaori would have liked, after her second swing almost made her fall over she put it down and tried the other. 
This one was far shorter and was much lighter. This one is closer to being good, but it's a bit short. Alright Kiba made two more swords. Kaori drew each and judged them. This one's a bit short still and the weight isn't right, she put down the first sword and drew the second, and this one's all wrong. Could you try and make one closer to the shinai the club uses? Alright give me a second. Kiba said trying again, this time making a single blade. Kaori plucked it from the ground and gave it a swing. It had the shape of a typical shinai, but instead of being malleable like a regular one it was solid, it had a silvery white handle with a black hilt, followed by a twisting pair of snow white and crimson cylinders, leading to a pointed top. This is perfect. Kaori said. Exact weight and the length is great. That's good. Because of your sacred gear it's more important that you land a hit than the damage that each hit deals, so you being comfortable with it is more important. However hitting the enemy 20 times with a stick won't do much, even if you are stealing half their speed with each strike. Kiba explained, because of this I made it so that you can easily channel magic into the blade and use it to empower your hits. This will make it so that even if the sword isn't sharp, you can still deal a lot of damage with it. Finally the pointed top is so that if you find yourself needing to deal the killing blow to an enemy, but you don't have any power left you can still finish off most enemies. Kiba finished. That's great, now all it needs is a name. Kaori said. Um, since it's yours I'll leave it up to you. Pick something cool. Kiba advised. Kaori looked at the sword inquisitively. Trying to pick a name for the sword. You don't need to name it right now. For now let's get lunch, we still have time to grab a quick bite before afternoon classes. You have kendo club today right? Issei said. Kaori nodded. Alright, can you swing by the occult research club afterwards, I'll introduce you to my aunt, and she can better explain what we do as devils. Issei said and the pair took off for the lunch hall. Time skip. Kaori was in the middle of a kendo match with her fellow freshman club member Yui Kadis. The pink-haired girl was putting up a good fight, but Kaori was having to do her best to make sure that she didn't accidentally use any of her devil strength or speed. Kadis was on the back foot and decided to try an underhanded trick to get one over on her opponent. Even if the two were just having a friendly match she couldn't help but feel a bit of rivalry with her. So how did it go with that boy yesterday? Kaori blushed deeply at this, but managed to block the incoming attack. What are you talking about? Kaori attempted to play dumb in hopes that she wouldn't accidentally spill too much. The boy that was waiting behind the club room, he had a letter that told him to wait there, and I saw you and him sneak off at lunch today, so what happened? Yui taunted, launching another strike. Nothing like that. He's just a friend. Kaori said. The friend that you had to send a letter to talk to in private. Yui continued taunting before she realized that she had distracted herself and ended up getting hit on the head losing the match. Guess that's what I get. She grumbled rubbing her head. Kaori smiled at her two left the hall and went to the changing rooms. So in all honesty is there anything between you two? Yui asked this time out of genuine curiosity. Nothing at the moment, just friends, doing better than junior high at least. Kaori said reluctantly. Junior high huh, how long have you been into him? Yui asked. Second year in junior high I got heatstroke after I decided to keep training despite the heatwave. Not my smartest move, but he carried me to the nurse's office and gave me a chill drink, that's what got me interested at least. Cute, that reminds me, I only got his last name yesterday. Yui said. Oh, yeah, he used to be a Seihaidu, but last year he reconnected with his birth family, and now he's a Gremory. Kaori said. Seriously? Yui sounded shocked. No if there is any relation to Ria's Gremory, the second year with the red hair that is like an actual princess. He did mention her, something about her being his aunt. His mom did look pretty young as well, so I guess it's not that hard to believe that his aunt is only a year older than him. Kaori said. If he's related to Ria's then why isn't he already the most popular guy in the school? Yui asked a little starstruck with Issei's relation to her idol. Probably because he hangs out with Kiba so much, Blondie casts a shadow that Issei is more than willing to relax in at the moment. Kaori explained. Give it a month and all the girls who get their hearts broken by Kiba will get over it and try their luck with Issei. And you'll have him on lockdown by then? Yui asked flashing her friend a grin. In an ideal world, yes. Kaori admitted with a smile as she prepared to leave. I've gotta go meet up with Issei, so I'll talk to you later Yui. At around the same time Yudo and Issei were chatting away near their lockers. So have you decided what to call your club yet? Yudo asked leaning against his locker. I probably won't need it for a while, so I haven't given it much thought. Issei said opening his locker ah. He yelped as a razor blade fell out and nicked him on the finger. Someone's popular. Yudo joked. That you one has twice as many, at least. Issei said. Yudo opened his locker so that the pair could verify, and four razor blades along with nine love letters fell out. The school really needs lockers with flat tops, it's dangerous if the top item falls out every time it's opened. 
Issei noted. I'll tell you what, let's have a wager. Yudo said looking devious, something that only Issei had ever really seen. When you hang around with mostly women and always act like a gentleman, it's hard to find a time to cut loose and have some stupid boyish fun. It was one of the things that Issei respected most in Yudo, that despite being popular with the girls and acting like a prince, he could still cut loose and act like a boy his age when he wanted to. This sounds like a terrible idea, what do you have in mind? Issei asked a grin covering his face. Whoever gets the most razor blades in their locker by the time you get your next peerage member and start your club wins. Yudo said plainly. And what are we betting? Issei asked intrigued. If I win, I get to name your club. Yudo said. And if I win you need to walk into the girls' art club and offer to model nude for them. Issei replied. Deal? Yudo said putting his hand out for Issei to shake. Issei grabbed it, and the pair shook hands. The pair shared a hearty laugh, and they made their way to the old school building picking up Kaori along the way. When the three first years arrived at the old school building they entered and went into the main room to meet with the president. Hey, Prez. Kiba said. Welcome you three, I'm glad to see you are doing better than last night Ms. Murayama, I am Ria's Gremory, I'm helping Issei out with being a devil for a while, so feel free to ask if you have any problems. I am still technically your senpai after all. Ria said with a smile. Thank you for having me and please call me Kaori, I can imagine we will be seeing each other rather often in the future Kaori responded. Very well then Kaori. I trust my knight has sorted you out with a weapon already. Ria said. Indeed, we got it all sorted at lunch, well everything but the name. So Murayama, have you got a name for the sword yet? Yudo asked. Yep, I'm gonna call it the Shitatsu Kota Kaori responded. Most of the club burst out laughing at the name, with the exception of Ria's who didn't get the joke and Kaneko who wasn't paying attention. Collision twig, really? That's great. Issei said through chuckles. Anyway you two can get started on contracts tonight, I had my familiar hand out some of your circles instead of mine today, so hopefully you will get some requests, I'll make sure that one of my servants comes with you for each request to make sure it goes well. Ria said. That night Issei and Kaori had their first contracts. Issei was paired up with Akeno, and Kaori was joined by Kiba. Issei's request came from a young woman by the name of Momo, when Issei showed up he was greeted by the pink-haired woman, who was wearing a full cabin rider pinky cosplay. She wanted someone to act out scenes from the show with her, but Issei hadn't seen the latest season, Grafia didn't take nights off his lessons, so Issei had no time to catch up on the show, so they just ended up binging the entire season, Akeno excused herself as the two sat down to watch it, reminding Issei to collect payment when he was done. When all was said and done she gave him the box it as payment, claiming that she could just buy another one, then said that they could act out some scenes next time. The retail value of the box set was about 6,000 yen, so Issei was feeling rather pleased with himself once he teleported back to the old school building. Riaz informed him that since he was his own king and he earned the payment himself, he could do with it as he pleased, so Issei took it home and placed it next to the other cabin rider pinky merchandise he had in his room. That was when Issei finally saw the marking on the box, it was signed by none other than Momo Mamazono. It was then that everything finally clicked. He knew that the girl who summoned him looked familiar, the costume was identical to the one used in the show. She even sounded identical to her character whenever she repeated a line from the show. Momo was the star of the show that he had just spent the evening binge watching with her. The part of him was kicking himself for not recognizing her, but another smarter part was telling him that it may be for the best that he played it down. If she knew that he was a fan of hers it might scare her off. Meanwhile Kaori and Kiba were summoned by an elderly woman, she was having trouble figuring out how to add her grandson on social media. After they managed to talk her through plugging in the screen to the computer and helping her send the friend request they were paid with a pretty old looking handbag which Kiba let Kaori keep. When they got back to the orc Rias commended Kaori on her first contract going well and told her about the stipend she would be getting in the future until Issei had started a club, at that point the stipend would go to him as Kaori's king. Kaori thanked Ria's and made her way home. She checked her phone on the way and saw that she had a message from Yui, she wanted to hang out that weekend, Kaori messaged Issei, and he said that they didn't have anything planned for that day, so she was clear to go. Time skip. It has now been a month since Issei started at Kuo Academy. Issei and Kaori had gone on a stray hunt with Sona and her peerage last week, and that thankfully ended with less issues than his first one. However there was another, far more serious issue about to present itself. Kaori's phone went off as she, Yui, and Issei were eating lunch. Kiba was off running an errand for Ria's today. When she took out her phone her face went white. Issei noticed this immediately and stopped what he was doing. Everything okay Kaori? Issei asked. Afraid not, seems like my dad got a promotion. Kaori said dejectedly as she put her phone in her pocket. Isn't that good? Yui asked confused. For him, yes. 
For mom, yes. For me, not so much. His promotion means he needs to move branches to Kyoto. Kaori said. Oh. Was all Issei could say in response. He made a mental note to deal with the issue later. So you will need to move away? Yui asked, a hint of sadness in her voice. Maybe. Kaori responded. If you leave, want me to take care of your boyfriend for you? Yui said with a massive grin. We aren't like that and for the last time, she doesn't like me like that. Issei said. Kaori turned and looked away from him in frustration. Boys could be so stupid, sometimes. If she didn't know him better she would have sworn he was doing it on purpose. At that point the bell rang interrupting her mental tirade. I'll talk to you after class, alright Kaori. We'll get this sorted out. Issei said before the three took off for class. After class Issei and Kaori made their way to his home. Issei had contacted his mother in hopes that she might be able to help them figure out a solution. When he got inside he was surprised to see not only his mother, but his father and little brother were all present and accounted for. Hey guys, did I do something wrong? Issei asked as he hesitantly entered the living room. Do you just assume that when I am here that you are in trouble? Serzich is asked. Am I? Issei asked unsure of the proper response to the question. No, I was just with your father when I got your message, so we decided to all come and visit you. Grafi responded. So what is the issue that's bothering you? She asked getting down to business. Well Kaori's dad got a promotion so her family is moving away, naturally since she is my knight and a member of my peerage, I think it's a mistake for her to move. I was hoping you could help us come up with a solution. Issei explained. Why not just get her to move in with you? Serzich is asked wondering why they hadn't just decided on what, to him, was the most logical solution. Huh? Issei and Kaori said at the same time. I mean, you have the space, and if the problem is her being alone, then this means you won't need to worry about her as much. Serzich is explained. Yeah because I can just say to my dad, hey I don't want to move with you guys, so I'm gonna move in with a boy instead. Kaori responded sarcastically. Serzich is laughed enjoying the girl's sarcasm. In his line of work he rarely met people that had a sense of humor, even less willing to show it in front of him, he hoped the rest of his son's peerage was as interesting and amusing as this one. Leave that to us. Milikus came up to Issei and tugged on his shirt, since I'm here can we play video games in Iki? Sure thing. Issei said taking his younger brother up to his bedroom. Alright then, let's head for your place and talk things over with your parents. Serzich is said. The following day Kaori's parents were taking off for Kyoto, Serzich's and Grafia had managed to talk them into letting Kaori stay with Issei, and sorted them out with a house in Kyoto, how they had it sorted out overnight was beyond Kaori, but sure enough by the time she got home from school, they were already packed and preparing to depart. Take care sweetie. Her mother said giving her a hug. Take good care of her alright boy. Her father said to Issei, who had come along to help move her stuff. Of course sir, I'll take care of her like my own family. Issei responded. He was faintly amused by the tough guy impression Kaori's father was trying to put on. Good. Her father scoffed. Sure he had agreed to let her stay with the boy, but he knew about her crush on him, and any father would dislike the boy who took their sweet angelic daughter away from them. The pair got into their car and took off. You okay? Issei asked. Kaori took a deep breath and nodded. I'll be fine. She replied, she knew that she wanted this, but it still scared her a little, losing her parents like this. Shall we start moving your stuff then? Issei asked. Walking to the door. All right then, Kaori responded. They then entered her house and went to her room. When they got in Issei noted that everything was already in boxes. You know we are teleporting everything right? You didn't need to pack them all up. Issei said. Well this way you won't see all my stuff. Kaori said. I can't have you stealing some of my underwear and claiming it went missing in the move. Issei made the magic circle on the floor and groaned. Just help me with the desk. The pair spent the next hour or so moving all of her stuff to a spare room in Issei's house, they skipped the bed, since the one in her new room was bigger anyway. When they were finished they ordered takeout, and Issei left Kaori to get settled in while they waited for it to arrive. She decided to call up Yui and talk to her friend about the past two days' events. Hey, how's it going? Yui asked. Hey, I managed to get it all sorted out with my parents last night, so I'm getting to stay in Kuo. Kaori said excitedly. That's awesome, so are you gonna be living alone? Yui asked. Not exactly. Kaori responded hesitantly. What's that supposed to mean? It means I'm kinda, staying at Issei's house, permanently. Kaori responded. How the hell did you convince them to let you stay with your boyfriend? Yui screamed into the phone. His parents had a talk with them and convinced them that it was the best solution. Kaori responded simply. Alright, listen here, this is a golden opportunity for you, and if you don't take advantage of it, then I will. Yui threatened. 
What do you mean? Kaori asked, confused. Despite all my help your relationship is the same as it was a month ago. Tomorrow morning when he wakes up make him breakfast or something. Guys like that kind of stuff, right? Yui said. You are living with a boy so take this chance to get with him. But bye. Kaori said distraught with her friend's interest in her relationship with her king. Wait, don't hang up. I was jock Yui shouted as Kaori hung up on her. Kaori buried her head in her pillows and let out a muffled scream. I suppose I could give him a bit of a show at least. Kaori finally conceded. Reaching under her shirt she unhooked her bra and took it off, leaving her shirt on the rough fabric caused her nipples to erect. It's not explicitly asking him to look at me, and I can just claim that I usually go braless at home, since this is my home now. Our home. She blushed when she thought of it as their home. Giving herself a once-over in the mirror, Kaori went downstairs to wait for the food with her king. End of the year. So that's it for today's video guys, before you go just like the video and share it with your friends. Bye.